Okay, let's get back to the markets. They have been selling off this morning. We've got jobs reports on both sides of the border. The U.S. jobs report in particular, job creation and higher than expected wage growth, sent a message to the markets that it complicates the story for the U.S. Fed in its fight against inflation. Philip Peterson is chief investment strategist at IG Wealth Management. Nice to see you. Good to be here. Happy Friday. Um, I guess I'll just start very broadly your reaction to these jobs reports on both sides of the border. Yeah, when we look at the Canadian jobs numbers, what you have to do is really take them in context of the 12-month moving average. If you notice month over month, the Canadian jobs data can be really lumpy. Yeah. And, and it seems unlike what, how an economy functions. So if you look at the 12-month moving average, the trend is still lower. So this one being in line, I think, is is closer to the reality. Then if you look at the United States, the trend line there is lower as well, but not to the same extent that we've seen in Canada. Yeah, okay, so then getting back to, because there's all these different moving parts we have to consider to understand the brain that is the markets, interest rates. So we're getting ready for that final interest rate decision of the year for the Bank of Canada. The Fed is gearing up for one as well. Uh, there was a view that we would see a Bank of Canada interest rate hike in that final decision, but a at a lesser pace than what we have seen. And just based on the market reaction this morning, it almost feels like that narrative is still intact. Um, can, can you give me your view on that? Yeah, we believe that the Bank of Canada will proceed with at least one more interest rate hike, but it's going to be softer than what we've seen through the year, maybe 25 basis points. And it's the tone of the message that I think is going to be more important. I think that's going to suggest that they are closer to the end, if not at the end, for a pause, at least, to see the impact of the rate hikes to date and what it means for the Canadian economy in the first quarter before they make any other decisions. In the United States, I think they're still, they still are pretty firm on further rate hikes. I think Powell does want to get closer to that 5% terminal rate, which is going to be probably 100 basis points above the overnight rate for the Bank of Canada. So I think we have now kind of landed on a new conversation point. It's kind of been building over the course of the last couple of weeks. But initially, since the Fed is so big and so powerful, you know, even though we're our own country dealing with our own issues, there was a feeling that, you know, if the Fed's going to be very hawkish, Canada's got to be right alongside the U.S. Federal Reserve. But now we're kind of starting to see that potential divergence in central bank strategy from here? Exactly, and I think it's because of the impact of the interest rate increases on the individual economies. In Canada, the interest rate increase affects every mortgage holder. Everyone is, that is going to be renewing a mortgage this year or over the next couple of years is going to renew at a higher rate. In the United States, where homeowners have locked into a 15-year fixed or 30-year fixed, it's only impacting the new homeowner. So the sensitivity to the housing market is greater in Canada than the U.S., and the housing market as a proportion of the overall economy is greater in Canada than the United States. So the Bank of Canada has to be aware of the impact on the broader economy to its interest rate increases that really affects that homeowner. Now, just to take a huge step back for a second for investors, that central banks are trying to address inflation, which is a huge problem, and everybody is dealing with it right now, and that they're navigating what this interest rate hiking, hike cycle has done to cool the economy but not kill the economy. Isn't that a, a, not a bad thing <laughs> if you're putting your money into the market and you're hoping that, you know, generally speaking, that there's a, you know, a reasonable road ahead? Yeah, at this point, I think if we look at where the central banks are in terms of their rate hiking cycle being closer to the end, that's actually a good thing for the markets. That means less downward pressure on multiples that have been absolutely uh, floored yeah. earlier this year and potentially more upside surprises into 2023. So there's a lot of bearish sentiment out there in the marketplace, and we're more muted in terms of our return expectations next year. But I think the risk of surprise is to the upside, not to the downside. Well, that's uh, and I really want to keep that dialogue going as we go through the end of the year, because, you know, you 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 have these sort of trends, especially on Wall Street. And I was saying earlier that now you have what looks like the the bulk of the S&P 500 strategists on Wall Street who think it'll be a negative year. But it's been very rare to see back to back negative rears in history. We have seen them, uh, but uh, nevertheless. Now, one of the other factors out there that people talk about is earnings compression uh, that you know, things are not great and companies' margins are going to get squeezed and then they're going to have to tell Wall Street and Wall Street's going to have to pull out the red pen again and that could be in another leg lower for stocks. 
where do you weigh in on that in terms of the stock market reaction? Right. So the stock market reaction to earnings, this is where I think uh, we have to put on our common sense hats and look at the economic data, the manufacturing data that's coming out of the U.S. The Chicago PMI earlier this week really said it all with that really, really low manufacturing number. Earnings are going to be flat at best, if not down. So the analyst expectations are too high, but I think everyone knows that. And I think that's already priced into the market for those that are looking at the economic data, not analyst expectations. Analyst expectations will be coming down next year, but if you ask anyone on the street saying, what do you think of earnings? They're too high, they're gonna be coming down. It seems obvious, and I think that has largely been priced in. Mm. And then I just want to talk about the different sectors because, you know, earnings compression, well, maybe that depends on what industry we're talking about. Uh, already, I think and most of our BNM Bloomberg audience knows that, you know, the S&P 500 skews pretty uh, heavily towards tech. The Canadian market skews more to financials. It skews more to energy mm -hmm. stocks. There's been all these people who have generally speaking been, you know, up a beat on the outlook for energy. Um, how are you thinking about different sector strategy right now? Well, I come at it in two perspectives. One is geographic. And so here, I think the U.S. will likely lag the rest of the world. The U.S. is still more expensive on a valuation perspective, and they're going to suffer the earnings drop that we'll see everywhere else. It's That is more priced in in Canada. Canada is trading at a very low level uh, in terms of valuation. Uh, Europe, the same thing. Asia, the same thing. So I think we're seeing a pivot, and we've started to see it, where the U.S. is underperforming the rest of the world. I think it can still do okay over the course of the next 12 months, but underperform the international markets that have more upside from a valuation perspective. When we look at the sectors, there too, I look at Canada and, and energy, I think is going to be a little bit more stable. We won't see the gains in oil prices next year as we've had this year. Uh, but I think with a weaker US dollar, and that's our view, that will support commodity prices at these levels, if not a little bit higher that will drive earnings perhaps a little bit better in Canada than the, the tech dominating uh, S&P 500 or obviously NASDAQ. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense. I guess the tricky part that I'm looking at, even though there, a lot of people look at the valuations of energy companies in this country and they say, look at them versus you know these other companies, there's still a lot of value there. Um, but it's just been such a complicated sector for investors. You know, I, I think back to the dot-com bust, and during that period, there was like basically a decade-long run-up in energy stocks, but we are coming off a decade where the majority of years have been down years for our energy sector, and there's still a, sort of a big conversation about where the industry is headed and you know where investor attention is going to be, the green economy, all that kind of stuff. Right. I think we have to be aware of that, but I, ultimately, I think it comes down to valuation, cash flow, dividends, what these companies can generate. We joke we say the energy companies have been taken over by the accountants, where it's all about the production <laughs> it's numbers. It's true, though, yeah. No, Philip, thank